is brought to you by Head Start Basketball. Having a gym available to them, having teammates around them that love the game, and having a culture where guys want to get into the gym, I believe you can get better. They can get better on their own with a teammate. Kent Dernbach is the men's basketball head coach at the University of Wisconsin Lacrosse. Kent was named head coach on March 12, 2018, and served as the Eagles' interim head coach for the 2017-2018 season. He is 80 and 39 overall, and 38 and 24 in the Wisconsin Intercollegiate Athletic Conference in his first five seasons. Dernbach previously served as associate head coach at UW Stevens Point from 2011 to 2017. He was the Pointers' interim head coach for the last 13 games of the 16-17 season, leading the team to an 8-5 record. UW Stevens Point made four straight NCAA Division III tournament appearances from 2012 to 2015. His fourth season with the Pointers culminated in winning the national championship in 2014-2015. Prior to arriving at UW Stevens Point, Dernbach was the director of basketball operations and an assistant coach at Northern Illinois University from 2009 to 2011. He served as Director of Basketball Operations at George Mason University from 2007 to 2009 and was an assistant coach at Marymount University from 2005 to 2007. Hey, Hoopheads, I wanted to take a minute to shout out our partners and friends at Dr. Dish Basketball. Their Dr. Dish shooting machines are undoubtedly the most advanced and user-friendly machines on the market. Learn more at drdishbasketball.com and follow their incredible content at Dr. Dish B-Ball on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Mention the Hoopheads podcast and save an extra $300 on the Dr. Dish Rebel, All-Star, and CT models. Visit drdishbasketball.com for details. That's a great deal, Hoopheads. Get your Dr. Dish shooting machine today. This is Kip Ione, head men's basketball coach at Willamette University, founder of Teams of Men, and you're listening to the Hoop Heads Podcast. Prepare like the pros with the all-new Fast Draw and Fast Scout. Fast Draw has been the number one play diagramming software for coaches for years. You'll quickly see why Fast Model Sports has the most compelling and intuitive basketball software out there. For a limited time, Fast Model is offering Hoop Heads listeners. 15% off Fast Draw and Fast Scout. Just use the code HHP15 at checkout to grab your discount and you'll be on your way to more efficient game prep and improved communication with your team. Fast Model also has new coaching content every week on its blog, plus play and drill diagrams on its play bank. Check out the links in the show notes for more. Fast Model Sports is the best in basketball. If you're looking to improve your coaching, please consider joining the Hoopheads Mentorship Program. We believe that having a mentor is the best way to maximize your potential and become a transformational coach. By matching you up with one of our experienced mentors, you'll develop a one-on-one relationship that will help your coaching, your team, your program, and your mindset. The Hoopheads Mentorship Program delivers mentoring services to basketball coaches at all levels through our team of experienced head coaches. Find out more at hoopheadspod.com or shoot me an email directly. Mike at hoopheadspod.com. Follow us on social media at hoopheadspod on Twitter and Instagram, and be sure to check out the Hoopheads Podcast Network for more great basketball content. Coach, do you have a point guard or leader you're going to be counting on next season to run the show for you? Don't leave their success and your team's success to chance, or you may end up disappointed. Thousands of coaches send their players to a point guard college camp each year so they can discover how to think the game, lead your team, and run the show. They'll send them back to you a smarter player, a better leader, and better equipped to foster a championship culture next season in practice and in the locker room. You can go to pgcbasketball.com to find a camp near you. Have a notebook handy as you listen to this episode with Kent Dernbach, head men's basketball coach at the University of Wisconsin Lacrosse. Hello and welcome to the Hoopheads Podcast. It's Mike Cleansing here without my co host Jason Sunkel tonight, but I am pleased to welcome to the podcast. Kent Dernbach, the head men's basketball coach at University of Wisconsin Lacrosse. Kent, welcome. Well, it's great to have you. I'm going to be here with you, Mike. Excited to have you on. Looking forward to diving into all of the things that you've done throughout your coaching career. Let's start by going back in time to when you were a kid. 
tell me about the earliest experiences with the game of basketball that you can remember. I remember kind of like being in our living room and dribbling the ball with my left hand and how excited my dad was, I think is like my first memory, <laughs> like of having the, of, of basketball. Like we, like our, our parents, like they, they redid their house. And I swore, I think it took like 15 years. Like, I think we were like, I'm like sub four <laughs> for like 15 years. And it didn't matter, right? Because you're just bound, bound, you know, you know better, better to dribble than carpet, right? I used to have to dribble on yeah. the carpet in front of my TV. Yeah, well, speaking, of, I I played on carpet when I was this, uh, in high school. We had a we had a high school wild rose, and they play, you played on carpet for my. Are you uh, serious? Up until, up until my junior year, you played on carpet. I remember my brother had to play in a regional final there, and they got permission from the librarian to go into the to the library to like dribble on carpet and practice on carpet, like oh to, to get the that's to hilarious. get the feeling for. That's, but that's what hilarious. happens. You, Small town, you know, small town, you know, 50 kids, 30 kids in a class. You kind of get weird things like that. But that's probably – that's like my first memory, over, you know, just overall, you know, with basketball. And I have three older brothers, so I didn't really have a choice, right? And my dad loved coaching um, and, it, it, you know, was willing to kind of like start like – um, summer leagues, like even be like kind of, I think before that was happening in Wisconsin, my dad, you know, had the highway 54 summer league with where he got other high school coaches together. And I remember him like sending letters, right? You'd have to send a letter of what date you're <laughs> going to get together to meet. And it's so different now, right? That stuff can be like organized in two seconds, just like this podcast. But it, but he, you know, he did that stuff. And um, you know, he's, he's just kind of that first coach that I ever had. Was it always basketball in your family or did you guys play multiple sports? Multiple sports. Um, basketball and baseball were uh, the most popular, you know, with it. And again, from being from a small town, um, Almond, Almond Bancroft has 100, 170, you know, in our school. Okay. In the high school. So we had the largest ever graduating class of like 54 in it. It's now down to like 20. And I, I say that uh, because I loved it, right? And I love where I'm from. But you just didn't have – if it was the spring, you played baseball, right? If it was the if it was the winter, you had football. There was no track or soccer or something like that or, you know, to go to and wrestling, whatever it is. Um, my senior year, we finally got track and field, you know, for the first time there. You know, if, if you're going to play a sport in the spring, you played baseball. If you didn't play baseball, then you went and – you know, you started working on uh, as a farmhand somewhere, and and that's just what it was. So there wasn't there was just probably that lack of opportunity um, where we were just you know basketball, baseball. All right. So from a basketball standpoint, living in a small town like that, how do you go about getting better as you start to take the game more seriously? How do you find pickup games, or are you just working on the game by yourself in the gym, or is it just you and your high school teammates? How would you guys approach that? Well, I, I was really lucky. My, my dad, uh, we grew up on a farm. We farmed a thousand acres of beans, peas, sweet corn, and field corn. And then, and for about 25 years, we raised about 300, 350 ostriches. So, um, we had a large shed and that had a, a hoop in it. Now, the ceiling was a little low where it was, it was tougher to get out to the three point line where sometimes it would, you know, if you're doing like a moonshot, you know, you'd, you'd hit the ceiling. So you, you kind of always got the right trajectory there, <laughs> but I mean, I spent so many hours in on that floor on that. Um, luckily, it wasn't um, uh, smooth concrete, right? It was rough concrete, so you could have a little grip on it, you know, down there when it got dusty. But my dad always would always say to me, you know, it's this, um, you know, the coolest place on the farm is in the shed, the coolest place, right? Because we didn't have air conditioning or anything like that. Our house didn't have air conditioning, no place had air conditioning. The coolest place on the farm is in, in that shed on that, on that cement floor. And I spent a ton of hours there. And, and then him and my, uh, my dad, and my mom being from Almond, Stevens Point's about 25 minutes away. And he got me joined in with the Points Hoops Club. And where, you know, they had their travel team with the Stevens Point area. And they were really, really looking back, they were, they were nice enough to let me join that. And, you know, I was, I was on, uh, back in the day, you know, teams in it. Now we have Premier, you know, we have uh, the Premier and then we have Platinum. And then we have, you know, all of these different names back then, right? We just had team A, B, and C. Right? You, you knew. Even, I was on even team. before. 
I was, I'm a little older than you. Before that, we only had, we had like team A. So in, in the yes, city of Cleveland, right. when I was playing, there was like one team yeah. from the west side of Cleveland, one team from the east side of Cleveland. That was it. Two teams. Done. Yeah. Yeah. Like now, like I, I go on, I watch, and God bless, there's so many great AAU programs out there. And there's so many people that want to play basketball that there's nothing wrong. Hey, there's just a lot of teams out there. But like oftentimes I'll be like, what one is the top team? Like you just get confused and, but there's never confusion. Like with us, you only had one team and we had team A, team B, team C and whatever team I was on. Well, that was, that was team C, Mike. I can tell you that. <laughs> All right. I can't let it pass without just asking you a one word question. Ostriches. Yeah. The better, the better red meat, the better red meat, you know, beef has like 16% fat. Ostrich has like 2% fat and it's not gamey. Right, it doesn't taste gaming. You just can't overcook it. It's really, really lean. It's great. It's great. Now, how do they? I mean, feel, how, do, how do they get? How, how do they get into that? Well, it, it, like farming. You know, you know, twenty five years ago, like interest rates were 13, 14, 15 percent. Right. So when you're taking out large farm loans and and you know and and corn. I don't know if there's any farmers out there, but corn are, is coming in at like a, a dollar or two a bushel. Like you're not making any money or, you know, sweet corn contracts, um, green bean contracts. There's no money in it. Uh, there was very little money in it at the time. I think now you, uh, you either have to go huge, right? Which farmers have done or you get out. And what my dad has, has done is, you know, they decided to go a different way where they still farm, but they thought they had to try to make some money another way. And so they got into the ostriches and we were actually like, like, like the number one producer, you know, close in the Midwest of, of ostrich meat. And it's a, you know, my, my That's parents, cool. That's like, very cool. yeah, they don't like, they don't like have a lot. They don't take a lot of pride in it. Actually. I think it's amazing. You know, two, you know, two people that, that didn't have a college degree that were really lived in central Wisconsin, just went out and they started uh, something so different, you know, raising ostriches. I give him so much credit for it. And I think it's, you know, probably one of the reasons that I've been willing to take chances in, in my career, you know, with different things as interim as interim tags and stuff like that, you know, because they were willing to take a chance on some things. It's very cool. It's a, obviously something that you don't hear about every single day. No. So definitely interesting. And you think about just as you said, the family farm has kind of gone by the wayside where you've either had these big industrialized farms or people, as you said, are kind of getting out of the business. When you think back to your time as a high school player, what's your favorite memory from being a high school basketball player? Um, there, you know, there's games, right? I remember winning like the regional title and then playing in a sectional championship. I remember, you know, knocking in two free throws um, to 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 advance in the playoffs. My my uh, uh, my junior year, like we're down by one with one second left and either you make them or you miss them right to, to go down. You know, there's just like certain memories like that, that, that pop up, but I'll, I'll say it again. And I go back to it. And I think just as you get older, Mike, and I'm sure you feel this way about, you know, with, with your dad and there's so many sons out there that feel this way about their parents that, that, you know, that try to coach them. But those moments of like just being in the gym, like I went home for Memorial Day this past weekend and to see my dad, who's 84 now in the gym, you know, working out with, I have four daughters and rebounding for them. And it just takes you back to that time. Like, uh, like how special that was growing up high school, grade school, how special that was, all those moments that you have with it. And, um, you know, there's great competition moments. But I, I, I think at the end of it, it's like so many things. It's the relationships that you have, you know, with your teammates. And then fortunately enough for me, it's the relationships that I had with my parents during that time. Sports just has a way of connecting people, again, across all walks of mm -hmm. life, but particularly yeah. parents and kids. I think if you have that sporting relationship with your parents, it's something that there's no way to, there's no way to describe that for no. someone who hasn't gone through. And it's what, what's been interesting, I'm sure for you and for me and you and I have talked about it a little bit on our pre-podcast call, just that connection that you have with your own kids and looking back at your life and your experience with your parents when you were a kid and then trying to translate that to once you become a parent 
and trying to figure out, well, how do I manage and navigate this with my own kids? And that's a whole conversation about oh. navigating the sports. The youth sports landscape is such a – it's such a wild west. And I, I've always said that one of the things that is more needed now than it's ever been is just trying to help parents to understand mm-hmm. what the system looks like, what's good about it, what they should watch out for. And as a parent, even when you know what the right thing to do, because so many people are out there doing things that maybe aren't the best, it's easy to get caught up in, well, we got to be doing this. We got to be doing that. We got to be doing this. And you sometimes forget, and I wish we could educate all parents, that there's lots of paths to be able to achieve whatever goal it is that you want to achieve. And then the other piece of it is that you have to remember why your kid is playing sports in the first place, because so many people are chasing something that is either completely unattainable or it's something that the parent wants and the kid doesn't. And ultimately for me, it comes back to, does your kid like to do whatever it is that they're doing? And do they want to do it by themselves? Do they want to do it on their own? Or is it always being forced upon them? And I think if you can take those two things into account, you're much more likely to have a good youth sports experience as a parent. Yeah, it's it's such it's such a struggle, right? I mean, I know with our oldest is nine and, you know, we're traveling up to Minneapolis for a soccer tournament this weekend. We talked about that before. And I'm like, I think to myself, what the heck are we doing? Like, what are we doing? <laughs> right. I mean, I, but, yep. but I also know she enjoys it. She enjoys it. And you know what? To be honest with you, I enjoy it. You know, I enjoy it. And you, you kind of maybe maybe eventually I, I won't as much, but. But I look forward to watching her compete if she enjoys it, right? And That's right. That's exactly it. Yeah. yeah. When you're not no, pulling teeth, to. when you're not pulling teeth to get them to go and do things, that's when it's really fun. And then it doesn't matter if you're down the street or you're going across state lines to go and compete. Yeah. When you get a chance to watch them do something that they enjoy doing. And again, in some cases, it's basketball. In some cases, it's soccer. In some cases, it's violin or whatever it is. When you get to see your kids do something that they love, there's nothing better than that. And I think as parents, as long as we remember that it's about our kids and it's not about us, which isn't always easy easy to do, yeah. trust me. Yeah. I've been in those situations where when my kids were younger, none of them were wired quite like me where I was a kid who you couldn't give me enough and I always wanted to do more. And my kids were not wired that way, especially when they were younger. And so that can be frustrating and it's easy to... Like, I'm just going to drag you to someplace that you don't really want to go because I think you should. And that inevitably never turns out well. And I learned over time that they've got to come to it on their own or you're just, you're, they're never going to get to where, where you want them to go unless they love it. Yeah. And the other thing that's really helped me, Mike, is like for the first time, I remember last year we went to a tournament and, you know, you know they don't have the positions out there in soccer and I don't really know them. I try to get to know, know the game a little <laughs> you're bit right, more. You're right, there with, you're right there with me. All of a sudden, the whistle blows in a soccer game. Yeah. I'm like, what was that? I don't, I don't know what happened. Yeah. Uh, I mean, when the goalie <laughs> can kick it, when he can, when she can throw it or roll right. it, I don't know. But anyway, it's but but it was like, you know, my daughter, my oldest daughter, her name's Camilla. And she normally was like scoring goals all the time. And then we went to this tournament and she was like on defense and she wasn't the striker. And I'm like, well, wait, why isn't she the striker? <laughs> and it was like for the first time I had that feeling already of like, oh, I, I, all the time I'm preaching, you know, we say this, I, I learned this from um, uh, coach Bob Semling, uh, you know, said it, I'm sure maybe somebody else said it before, but, you know, uh, cheer for your son hard, cheer for your son's teammates harder. And that's when I get our, when I get our parents together for our inner squad scrimmage at the beginning of the year. So everybody gets to know each other before the season. Right, everybody's happy with me after the inner squad inner squad scrimmage with playing time. Right, everybody's real <laughs> pleased with her. So we all get together and then we come into a room and I lecture. Right, I sit up there and I lecture and I say that you know to them. And it was for the first time I'm like, oh, I I and that's and that's eighth grade eight year old soccer. Like it's a challenge for parents to see their son sit the bench. Right, when they've played their entire life with it, when they've played. Yeah, I, I know I'm just going off. I mean, we can get into that later, you know, into the, you know, this stuff of just how challenging that is for not only the player, but their family and everybody that surrounds them um, um, for them to learn how to help a team on the court and to be able to get there. And I guess I'm just saying it was the, for the first time I felt that in a very, very small way 
um, in eight-year-old soccer. Yeah, there's no way to duplicate that feeling as mm-hmm. a parent. Like you can, you can think you understand it, but until you're in that situation, you don't understand how frustrating that can be. And it won't be the first time probably you feel that, Kent, and I've felt it. And when you go and you sit and you're like, well, why? Just from a soccer standpoint, like, why is my kid on defense? Why aren't they getting a chance yeah, yeah. to play offense? And then you get to basketball and you're like, well, why Why are they out of the game? And they should be playing all yeah. the time. And they're better than this kid who's going in. And you see that it's very, very easy. And you're a person, I'm a person who understands those pitfalls. And yet we still feel those yeah. things. Now, now, hopefully we're mature enough not to act on them. But yep. – but you feel them. And so you can understand where parents sometimes can do things that maybe they wouldn't under ordinary circumstances just because of those feelings. So let's, even though we're jumping ahead a little bit, I think it's worth having this discussion right now because you're talking, you're talking about it. When you start thinking about players who are on your roster, who aren't playing and you have to have that conversation with them, whether it's preseason of like, look, going into the season, I don't really see a role for you out on the floor, but here's some things I do need from you. Just how do you approach those conversations either before the season, in season with kids who aren't getting the minutes that obviously they would want, everybody wants to be out on the floor? Yeah. You know, we start really in the recruiting process with it, with it, Mike, where, I mean, I remember sitting down and, you know, for the first time here at lacrosse, um, uh, some of our, our staff is like look, listening to me talk to a recruit where we talk about how they're going to fail. You know, like, hey, you're our top recruit all the way down to somebody that hey, we're not quite sure about. We're just talking, you know, about, but we talk about how you are going to fail. You're going to, you're going to be the reason why your team wins big games in high school, maybe a state championship in high school, and then you're going to get to college. And if we're any good, you are going to be the reason why your team loses a drill and how humbling that is and what a challenge that's going to be for you. And you're going to fail, 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 fail. And then you're going to have a little glimpse of success. And then you're going to go right back to, to failing. And you're not sure if you're going to be good enough. And I've had that conversation, basically it's kind of those exact words with a little bit more in depth to it with every single kid that has that has come to lacrosse and i think because of that you know mike it's one of the reasons why we've never had a kid transfer to another school that we you know we any any kid that we've ever recruited to uw lacrosse has never transferred to go play basketball at another school now it's only it's been five years and next year it could happen or whatever it is but we take great pride in that because hopefully we're really honest during the recruiting process with them how hard it is to get on the court and then when they come in and they're not sure, you know, kids, uh, the kid might not know it. His teammates always know, right? Like, like, I remember my first year at lacrosse and, and I was the interim head coach and we, I got the job the day after the season started. So we're like practicing and, and I'm like, let's get our five starters out there. I didn't know who the hell the five starters were. Mike. <laughs> right. First five, first five that ran out there. Right. The first five that ran out there. And you know what? Those five guys were our starters. And those five guys um, a year later started every single game and were uh, led us to the, our, our second NCAA tournament in program history, right? The first one like in 20-some years. And like kids know. Like kids actually know, I think, at a certain uh, – at least at the college level, who's supposed to be playing and who's not supposed to be playing. I I really think that. So kind of back to your point, maybe the the individual doesn't know it, but as uh, we try to be honest in the recruiting process and we try to not beat around the bush um, if somebody has a question for it. And and I know the word fail, I say fail, fail, fail. And you're like, well, that guy's guy's something, right? No, I think it, it, it doesn't mean that that it's a negative word. It just is just the honest truth. And kids want honesty. They want to know. They don't want to be, they don't want to get beat around, you know, to say like, well, if you could, you know, do this, this, this. No, it's like, exactly. You don't get in a stance and you can't guard. And the next week they come in, well, coach, I'm working at it. Well, you still can't get in a stance and you still can't guard. <laughs> you know, like it doesn't change the reason. And if you and if you kind of like try to 
be soft with it or whatever, I, I feel that's wrong, right? And, and you're not going to get anywhere with it. And I know I, I, I sound so like, oh, I, it sounds like um, I'm, pa- I'm passionate about this subject because I believe it's the correct way to go about it. And I've seen it work. And I've, I've, I've seen guys not leave, not quit, but want to be challenged and get to the point where they're good enough to get on the floor to help, or, you know, help um, hopefully a top 25, top 50 program in the country win games. If you're not honest with them and you don't get right to the point, if you're wishy-washy, it makes it really easy for a kid to misinterpret what's being said. And then I think there's nothing worse for a player than to be confused about where they stand with their coaching staff. That's an awful way Mm -hmm. to go into a game, a season, a segment of the season where you're not sure exactly where you stand or you go in thinking, Hey, this is going to be my time because coach said I'm getting better. And I think I'm going to get some minutes this game. And then suddenly you don't play at all. That's where you get into that, lack of clear communication is where problems arise. If a kid knows, here's exactly where I stand, then they're less surprised when they don't get the minute that when they don't get minutes because you've already you've already prepared them. You've had that conversation. I think to your point too about kids knowing, I think ultimately when you look at it, I don't care what level we're talking about, maybe if you get down to the elementary school level and the middle school level, you have kids who are somewhat delusional about their abilities. But I think by the time you get to a high school varsity level and certainly in college, kids know, like if there's a kid playing ahead of ahead of you, it's very rare the player who honestly deep down doesn't know why that kid's playing ahead of them. Now, I guess it could happen sometimes, but for the most part, I think a lot of those problems come from the people around the player, whether yep. that's the parents, yep. their friends, somebody back home is saying, well, how can this kid be playing ahead of you? That's where those problems come in. It's not the kid ultimately knows because they're out there on the floor against whoever they're going up against every day in practice. I think, I think they know. Yeah, I I agree with you a hundred percent. I really do believe they know. And I, and it it happens sometimes and uh, where, where somebody is so just has a lack of lack of self-awareness, you know, where they're at on it. But I also think that, um, when you're recruiting, you can kind of tell that individual, you know, not all the time, but I think, you know, if there's 50 kids out there that are, you know, you know, if there's 10% of the kids that are like that out there, I think you could cut half of those out through the recruiting process. So then the number becomes even less where you can tell, you can tell just in their conversations and the parents' conversations, you know, uh, of, of what kind of individual this is going to be. And, um, we we're just we've been just so lucky that we've just had such great parents and and really good kids. Doesn't mean that we're it's it's all sunshine and rainbows, right? That's that's not it at all. When there's love and emotion or um, involved, how how can you know how can you avoid having conflict? There's going to be conflict. I when like I, when a kid commits to me, I always I thank I thank them and I tell the parents like I will not take this for granted. You know, basketball is a priority for your son. It's, you know, you have family and basketball probably in their life along with academics, right? For, you know, you know, some kids are just smart or, you know, however they do it, right? But those three things, you know, maybe they're, they're faith for, for other kids, but it's certainly a priority and they're putting that faith in me and our staff and our program and our, and our school. And I'll never take that for granted, like what we owe them right? What we owe them. And that's just to be honest with them. I can't guarantee them they're going to have a great career, but I can guarantee them that I'm going to work my butt off for them. And, and fortunate enough, that's, that's been good enough, um, you know, to, to keep guys feeling good about our program and where they're at. Well, to your point, when you're talking about that during the recruiting process and you're already having those conversations, you're tending to then bring in kids who want that style of coaching, who want that type of honesty, who want to have those conversations. And as you said, you've already weeded out a lot of guys who probably wouldn't fit in with the type of culture that you're trying to build. And ultimately, that's, I think, how you have success. Let's go back in time. When did coaching get on your radar? When's the first time you started thinking about, hey, I want to be a coach? Growing up with yeah. your dad coaching you, was was it yeah. something that was always on your mind or 
Was it a case where, hey, I'm playing, I'm playing, I'm playing, and now I get done and I'm looking around saying, man, I still want to be involved in the game. Maybe I got to think about coaching. I, I, when I was at Carthage, I, we had some great teams there. Went to a, went to a Final Four, you know, went to another Sweet 16. Uh, I waved a heck of a towel there, Mike. Nobody waved. I, I swear. I, I swear. You were like you, – you were the ML Carr. You remember ML Carr from the, from oh, the Celtics? Yeah, yeah. He used to be the guy that yeah, – but, but, you always had the towel going. Yeah, yeah. I never played one minute of college basketball. Never once did I get into a, to a varsity game. And I lettered for three years. How about that? You know, like so. You were doing. You were, do, my, you were doing something right. You were doing something right behind the scenes. I had to do something. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I folded. I remember we went to the Final Four, and and I, um, and I ironed Jim Aboykowiches and, and Jason Wortel <laughs> and Antoine McDaniel's <laughs> Daniel shirt be, be, before before we had the banquet. I think that was that's about what he. But um, I, you know, I went. I, I didn't know what I was going to do out of, you know, out of um, um out of college. You know, I had the sport management degree, psychology degree, and I kind of thought I wanted to get into coaching a little bit. And I tried to get a GA position somewhere. And fortunately enough, um, I, I reached out to all these schools and it just happened to be late that Ohio State um, reached, got back to me. And I was calling, her name was Leslie Barnes. She worked in the academic support service office there. And I remember like calling Leslie all the time and to the front desk of it was called the Sasso office. It was like one of the one of the first academic support service offices, you know, really in the country. That that was big time, right? They had their own building there, and and I remember calling there, and I could even hear Leslie in the back. I'm not here. I'm not here, right? Because I'd be calling, <laughs> I'd be calling up there because I'm just looking for somebody to pay for my schooling. And I'll never forget. I'm in like the, I'm in this field. I'm disking. Um, you know, at, at some time like in late, uh, it, you know, in June or something like that. And I get a, a phone call from Ohio State and somebody dropped out. And I think because I kept calling every day, Leslie's like, well, just give it to this kid, right? Let's just give the GA <laughs> position to this kid. So I went there and they paid for my schooling and, and I was not qualified to be in that office at all. There are some great counselors in there working with student athletes. And then there was me, right? I don't know what I was doing. I, I, the, they didn't get their value out of me at all, but I was so <laughs> thankful that they paid. They paid. They paid for that, and then it was kind of that year. There was gonna, some transition going through if we we're going to keep our GA spot or not. And I went back home for Christmas, and um, uh, you know, long story short, we're Catholic. We're supposed to be going to a church, you know, that my mom thinks is like f at five o'clock. Instead, it was actually at four o'clock. So it's already going on, but we're already in the town over to go to church. And my dad's like, well, the Methodist church is starting right now. You know, what's the difference? Let's go to the Methodist church. So we go to the Methodist church for Christmas. And in front of me is sitting Eric Conkle, who now is the head coach at, um, at Tulsa, right? Just was at Louisiana Tech. And he was from that town. And I didn't approach Eric there, but later on I emailed him and I said, hey, Eric, is there a way that, you know, what do you think about getting into coaching? And he's like, well, you should work the Morgan Wooten basketball camp. You know, he emailed me back and he's like, here's the contact information. And it was the best summer that I ever had in my life. I, I, I traveled up and down the East Coast, living out of my Jeep Wrangler, working five-star camps, the Morgan Wooten camp, any other camp that, that was available, the Eastern Invitational and, and, um, um, working camps and, and getting into it. And lucky enough, I, you know, I caught, um, Joe Wooten's eye and, and his good friend, Scott McClary. And then they offered me a position, you know, for $2,000 at Marymount University. So then I packed my bags up from Ohio State and, you know, drove out to, to Arlington, Virginia, Fairfax, Virginia. And it was Arlington, Virginia, Marymount. And then, and then it was out there. So there wasn't like a time where I was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to get into coaching. It just kind of, it's in your blood, right? And, um, and then I just took a chance, right? I took a chance of, of staying at uh, um, um, staying at Country Inn and Suites, staying in their parking lot, sleeping there in their <laughs> parking lot, waking up in the morning, and at that time there was always a shower next to the pool. Right? You if you know if you just walk in, and you act like you know that you know what the hell you're doing. They just let That's you right. go. So yep. I'd go in there, I'd shower at the Country Inn and Suites at their the the shower next to the pool. You know, they usually had a continental breakfast. Grab grab a bagel on the way out, and then I'd go work camp. And I did that for an entire summer and it was amazing. 
the amount of things that I learned, listen to Morgan Wooten talk, oh, listen to Joe Wooten and what he does, does at Bishop O'Connell and the passion that he has in that league. Glenn Farello was there, who was at, who's the Paul VI coach now. Like so many great coaches were there. Mike Rhodes came in and spoke, who's the head coach at VCU. Like it was amazing. It was just amazing, the experience there. And, and then, um, and then I got the job at Marymount and bartended at night and, and coach basketball, 6 a.m. practices in the morning. Was coaching what you thought it was going to be? No. I Like, looking back, Mike, like, I don't know what I what value I brought. You know, like, <laughs> I swear, I don't. I hear you. No, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know, no, I know exactly what the what hell mean. I brought to practice. I, I don't know. Like, I don't think I brought anything to practice until finally when I got to Stevens Point Maybe a little bit my last couple years at Northern Illinois, but my first time. So at Marymount, I I didn't bring anything to Scott McClary's staff other than like being a good guy and going out and recruiting, and would have like a beer with him, you know, so he could get away from his family. Like that was it. <laughs> Scott McClary was the head coach at he he was at Marymount, then he went to Muhlenberg, and now he's a really successful coach in the Pennsylvania area. Um, his team just won a state title there, but but he you know he gave he he. He gave me that opportunity, right, to, to break in. And everybody, so many people have stories, you know, like that, where it's just what it takes to get into the business. And um, um, I don't know how the heck I did it. I just know that I would never trade it, right? I would never trade the, this journey to what's gotten me to this point right now. And, and, um, and it doesn't mean, and, and that doesn't mean like I'm anywhere, you know, I love where I'm at, but I'm just saying like it, it was, it's been an incredible run. This sport has been incredible to me. And, and I just love, I love coaching. I love coaching. What did you love about it right from the very beginning? So obviously, Hey, I don't really know what I'm doing, but clearly even with not knowing what you're doing, there's something about it that strikes a chord with you. So when you think back to that yeah. first experience, what's something that you're like right off the bat, you're like, man, I love this aspect of coaching. The look, the look at a player's eyes when they believe in you. When somebody believes in you, right? And maybe not entirely, maybe not, they don't believe in your personal life or anything, but they believe in what you're telling them. And I, and one of the first guys that I had that feeling with is actually when I was at Carthage, I was coaching in the Christian Youth Council. The, this little, you know, it's like the YMCA in Kenosha, Wisconsin. And his name was Steve Durakovich, who went on to be a great player at Carthage. I played for his dad, Bosco. Well, I can't say I played because I never got into a game, but, you know, I lettered for his dad. But I lettered for, I lettered for Bosco. And Steve was like a, I don't know, I don't know, like a third or fourth grader. And he was a really good player. And, and Steve was the first one that gave me that look. And I, it's addicting, right? It's just, and it's and and that's like oh that's just self gratifying but it really it was I, if you're that's the honest truth like to have somebody look at you and believe in you um, just like hopefully I'm doing to our players and guys that I coach hopefully my my daughters feel that every single day for me and my wife and other people that I love that but but to have somebody believe in you right and 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 the satisfaction that it, that you get from that and then from there you know. Um, there's so many things developing a team and you know now as a head coach like seeing a team grow seeing a young man grow with it um that's all you know that's all that's all great stuff and and then i will say this winning is fun the feeling after a win oh god it's addicting isn't it addicting, Mike? <laughs> it, really, feeling? it really it really it really is i mean i think if you're a competitive person that w when you start thinking about what it what it means to to win games. And, you know, you have that question of do you, how much do you love to win versus hate to lose? And I think it's always an interesting question to answer. And I, I look at myself and I think I always go back to, for me, it's always, uh, I hated to lose more than I love to win because I think as, as a player, especially early on, and then in coaching, when I was coaching, I was an assistant varsity coach. So it's not the same when you're an assistant because that one loss record doesn't go, yep. it doesn't get attached to your name. So it's not quite the same you don't get that quite that same personal feeling that you do when you're a head coach or when you're a player. But I always felt like because as a player, you're used to winning that the losses 
stand out to me. Like if you ask me to remember games from my career, I'm much more likely to remember the losses than I am the win. So for me, that always equates back to I hate to lose. And yet at the same time, what you just described completely resonates with me, which is that feeling of winning is one that you just you just keep craving. You can't get enough of it as a competitor. Yeah. Well, I and I I don't know. I think this is to to an extreme, right? You know, there, there's addiction in just about every family that's out there, and and so so I I try to be sensitive to that, uh, and including ours, and and but I I believe I'm addicted to that feeling. I think it's I think there's. When you love somebody, there. When you love something as much as I love the game of basketball and coaching, there are so many reasons why you love it, right? There's so many reasons, but one of the reasons, and we just is is that feeling, and I believe that I'm addicted to that feeling. Like I, it's like why the and then the pain, like you want to fe- curl up in a in a fetal <laughs> position when you lose, like oh, you know what I mean? I don't know. I know I, exactly what you mean. Show, extreme- showing your. Showing yeah. your face, that was always the thing that was hardest for me. And it wasn't, again, because I wasn't a head coach, I didn't feel it in the same way as I did when I was a player. But I know when I was a player and I lost games, it would be so hard to show up at school the next day. And it would be so hard to answer questions from, go back to the dorm room and answer questions from your roommate or your friends. Hey, what happened? Or, hey, how come you didn't play very well? And like those things just... The pain of those, the sting of having to answer those questions and like feeling that wind slip through your fingers, that's a pain. It's definitely a painful feeling. And I think that it's something, like I said before, if you're a competitive person, it's really hard to lose when you know that that feeling of winning was sitting right there in front of you. Yeah. And, and, um, and it doesn't mean like you show that to like your players, right? Or it's not like right. you showed that to like the fans or anything because you played at a high level. So, I mean, it's, it's, there's, you know, you know, you had to answer some questions for that, right? It doesn't mean you did that, but internally, that's just how you feel. Like I, I honestly, you know, you can't sleep. And, and after the, the win, the euphoria, and after a big win, the, oh, I don't know. It's addicting, right? It, it, it's addicting. <laughs> it really is. All right. So let's jump from your experience at Marymount where you're bringing little to no value to your job. <laughs> and now suddenly you're going to get another job and you're going to go to yeah. George Mason at the Division One level. Yeah, How does yeah. that happen? How does that happen? Yeah, well, um, uh, Glenn Farello, who's the head coach at Paul the Six, thinks it's so funny because – Nearly every job I've gotten, I've never actually been offered the position, right? When I went to Marymount, I ended up just starting working their camp. You know, Scott McCrary said, come down and work our camp. And then all of a sudden, I was his, you know, his big time $2,000 paid assistant coach, <laughs> right? You know, bartending at Bob O's. And, and then when I went to George Mason, I'll never forget, Joe, um, the position was open. Joe Bear was leaving. Joe Bear, who's now the, um, the head coach for the Lakeville Magic great coach really really good coach and um and he, he uh, i i just kind of got to i got to know him a little bit through eric conkle and then ended up rooming with him and chris caputo who's the head coach at george washington right now okay so when i moved out east i had no place to live and eric conkle got me in, in touch with these guys and uh, i lived in their dining room i put up a curtain and i lived in their dining room and they were at george mason and i was at marymount so then Joe Bear decided to leave. He wanted to go learn a different system. So he was going to go up and work at Brother Rice High School um, in, in Chicago. And so I put my name in there, right? And the, the entire time, Paul DeStefano, who was the head coach at St. John's in, that, in, that, um, in the Washington Catholic League, he had a son who was going to get the job. He was just going to, he was going to move into the ops role over, you know, over there. And then all of a sudden at the last second, uh, um, uh, uh, Tommy Amaker, I believe, went to Harvard, right? And he's a Duke guy. So then he ends up bringing the other guy with it. And so Joe Bear is like, hey, why don't you just come over here and start working? Why don't you just come over here? So I just started showing up. I just started showing up at George Mason <laughs> and just started doing the job, started doing the job. And then before you know it, I got, I got, I got some, I got, I got a check. I got paid 
for it. To nice, this day, nice. Coach, Coach, Coach Larinaga has never told me that I'm his guy, that he's hiring me. No. Now, he's, he, now, we had like an interview process and things like that where he got to know me more. But to this day, you know, it's just, it's, it's just kind of how it worked out. You just start working the job and then hopefully you're good enough and, and they don't want you to leave. And <laughs> I, remember, I still remember Chris Caputo telling me, though, he goes, you're ambitious. You got some initiative, but you don't know what the hell you're, you don't know what the hell you're doing. And you don't even know that you don't know what the hell you're doing. You're just doing it. But it was it all right. So, so how do you, so how talk, do you go about how do you go about learning? Like as you're as you're going through yeah. this, you're obviously learning from the guys on your staff. But what are you doing outside of your hours on the job? Are you reading? Are you watching film? Are you trying to get talk to mentors yeah. outside of the staff? How are you trying to improve your craft so that you're more prepared for the next opportunity and that, and that you're continuing to, to just grow in the position that you're in. Yeah. Well, I was the director of ops there and, um, and it was very clear that that was my role as the director of ops and coach Larinaga doesn't cheat. He just doesn't cheat. It's like when the whole, whole thing came out a couple years back, like, and like Miami was into it. He doesn't cheat. And I know he doesn't cheat because I was with him and I worked with him. He wouldn't let me touch a basketball because director of ops couldn't touch a basketball. That was illegal, right, to be able to do that. And so it's like, okay, if, if my impact's not going to come on the floor with it, then how, how good can I be at running an operation, at team travel and things like that? So to your question, it wasn't basketball stuff that I learned. I, tr I just learned from secretaries. I learned from from travel agents and things like that, how to do it really, really well, how to do, how to do that part of the job really, really well. So I was helping the staff out. So they never had to worry about anything administrative wise, never had to worry about it. And then when I felt comfortable enough doing that, then you gain the respect of, of, of getting basketball knowledge with it. And I think that's so important is it's easy to, to not be pleased in the role that you're in, but you can't you can't expand your role until you're great in the job that you were hired for, you know, in what you're supposed to be doing currently, and that's that's what I tried to do, and with that, then I brought value. Then I could then then I could expand my game a little bit more, you know, from there, so to say, uh, or uh, so to speak. Is I, but you have to do a great job, and what the heck role you're supposed to be in. And if you don't enjoy that role that you're supposed to be in, that you're hired to do, then get the hell out. It's it's not, it's not nobody else's fault, right? If you go into a situation or you go into a job and you know the head coach is this way or they do things this way or this is what the job is going to be, well, then don't, don't complain when that's what the job is. Don't complain. Find out what the job is and understand if you like it or not. And then can you deal with it? And can you be, can you, can you try to be great at it? And I'm not saying I was great at it, Mike. I'm just saying that was my approach to it. And I, I got that approach from farming. I got that approach from growing up farming, picking rock. I, you walk up and down a field and you pick rock. You see a rock, you pick it up, you put it in a wagon. I mean, that's what I did growing up. There's no enjoyment in that, but you better do it. You better do it well. Or when the bean picker comes across and there's a rock and it goes over that rock, well, it misses that role and the other seven rows right next to it. So those beans don't get picked and you don't get paid for it. All right. It's just simple things that you have to be able to do. And that's where my foundation comes from. Again, it, it, it is from is from my time growing up. Your first impression is everything when applying for a new coaching job. A professional coaching portfolio is the tool that highlights your coaching achievements and philosophies. And most of all, helps separate you and your abilities from the other applicants. The Coaching Portfolio Guide is an instructional membership-based website that helps you develop a personalized portfolio. Each section of the Portfolio Guide provides detailed instructions on how to organize your portfolio in a professional manner. The guide also provides sample documents for each section of your portfolio that you can copy, modify, and add to your personal portfolio. As a Hoopheads Pod listener, you can get your Coaching Portfolio Guide for just $25. Visit coachingportfolioguide.com slash hoopheads to learn more. At this stage in your career, so you've gone from Marymount, then you're at George Mason, then you get an opportunity at Northern Illinois. Where are you in terms of 
your thoughts long term for for your career, or are you thinking about just what you just described, which is I'm just trying to be great at what I do, and if another opportunity comes my way, great. Or are you starting to think? Hey, what level do I want to be at, or is it more just opportunities kind of come across your across your desk? No, it's a, it's a great question. It was it was really during that time, during my second year, where I realized: Am I going to be an East Coast guy, or am I going to get back to the Midwest? You know, um, because if I because I could have stayed at George um, at George Mason, and then who knows? You know, hopefully Coach Larinaga would have taken me to with with him to Miami, right? I don't know, but but I I could have done that. But all my connections then would have been on the East Coast. And that's where you're probably going to have your life then is on the East Coast. And that, that's fine. But um, I uh, I had a girlfriend at the time that was my high school sweetheart. I knew I wanted to get back to the Midwest. I happened to observe the best Division Three league in the country in the WIAC. I mean, I, there's other good leagues out there, but nobody's going to argue that the WIAC's not the best. It's just what it is. And so I observed that growing up watching watching great players, you know, uh, growing up out of this league. It's like I knew I wanted to get back this way and so i took a chance that was for like the first time where i kind of like took control of like hey i'm leaving something that's good really really good to go to a situation that might not be good but um but it's getting me closer to where i want to be and where where i see myself spending the rest of my career and that's somewhere in the midwest so at that point it was more of a geographic decision than it was necessarily a level decision Yep. Yep. Exactly. And and I I you know, I, um, I loved my time at, at Mason. I just I just kind of thought I was on the East Coast enough. I wanted to get back to the Midwest and the opportunity. And I didn't know Ricardo Patton. I had no connection to that staff at all. Um, and I just give him a heck of a lot of credit for for taking a chance on me. And and I wanted to get back, you know, over there. And I also felt like I was probably going to have a little bit more of a not maybe not a voice, but just a little bit more involved in some basketball things um, there. And that turned out to be true. So it was just the right move. It was just the right move for me. And, and you know, we ended up getting fired two years later, you know, from that position um, and then and then got hired back on by Mark Montgomery. You know, I just, um, who did a great job at Northern Illinois and, um, and now is at Michigan State. And it just kind of went from there. So at that point, it, w- it was a geographical decision. How much did you miss being on the court or how much did not being able to be on the court when you were in the ops positions? How much did, how hard was that to just kind of, again, do the behind the scenes thing? And I know you described how, hey, you got to do what you got to do. And you understood that going in. But just how much when you would walk by the practice floor and you'd see your fellow staff mates out there actually getting to coach and you got to go in and mail some envelopes or run some copies how, how just how did you handle that yeah and it wasn't quite that extreme i was always at practice and things like that but still it was that feeling and it's it and it's why i ended up making probably what ended up making the move right where i just couldn't do that anymore um with it i needed to get back on the floor and even though i went to the ops role at northern illinois it was going to be more of a a coaching type role there and learning from a different staff you know um a, a, as well with ricardo Patton and sundance wicks um, who, uh, and, and Todd Townsend, well, yeah, it was just, it was just, it was the right move for me. So it re- it did, it did bother me. And cause I know sometimes I, I, I would get concerned with, if you're too good at that role, then can you ever get out of that role? Right. right. You know, you, you start talking to people like that. Well, you don't, you don't want to be too good in that role because then that's all you're ever going to be too. So that was the other reason, you know, that I that I took a chance with with Northern Illinois and and Ricardo Pat, and it was a great experience, you know, for me. It's you know growing up in uh, in 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 central Wisconsin and a you know lack of diversity, right? Really, a lack of diversity, and then you know you you more uh, more di- more uh, different backgrounds. You know, when I was at Carthage and then Ohio State, when I was a freshman coach at West Whetstone High School, that was really good, a diverse background, and then moving out east. But then being able to work for for Ricardo Patton in the dynamic that that brought up of of working for a minority man, right? And what he had to deal with and things that were, it, it was just so eye-opening 
to me to, to experience that with him because I was tied to him, right? I was tied to Ricardo and what was what Ricardo was dealing with, which Coach Patton was dealing with. And it was it was for the first time like, well, this this really is. This really is something. This is this is real. There there is there is a difference here. And um I don't know, that's I don't know where that kind of came out of. I really haven't explained that to too many people, Mike, but but it was just a great experience for me. And Ricardo Patton, Coach Patton, is a great man. He's a great, he's a great man and a really good basketball coach. I mean, he had to be. He was at Colorado for 10 years with John C. Phillips. But um, that it was a really, really good time in my life, and I learned a ton. How does the opportunity at Stevens Point come to you, and then what made you yeah. go for that opportunity? Yeah, it's, so Coach Patton got let go, and then – Mark Montgomery came in. Um, I met with him. I remember I met with him at 11.45 p.m. In a, in a suit and tie. And I walk into the <laughs> office and, you know, he tells me, he's like, Kent, I don't have a position for you. Right? I don't have a position for you. And, you know, who would? I don't know him. He's got his own guys coming in, right? He's coming from Michigan State. He's got his own guys and all that tree. So, um, um, and I said, well, coach, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show up every single day until you tell me not to. And it was, it was about two and a half months. I mean, I, I showed guys around campus that were interviewing for my job. I had to show them around campus. And soon enough, I was giving him a ride to the airport one time. And he, and he, he told the guy, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with, I'm gonna go with the guy that's been here, Kent. He's, he's, he's going to be our ops guy. And that's how I found out that I got the job. So it was just <laughs> another one of those situations. Like, I, you know, you just start working the job and hopefully nobody – tells you to go anywhere. Nine, 90% and, uh, of the battle is just showing up, right? Yeah, just showing up, just showing up and, and not being an a-hole, you know, being somebody that's enjoyable to be around, hopefully, right, most of the time. And, and uh, but then I was with him for six months and then the opportunity came up at, at, um, at Stevens Point and, and, I, and I, I took it to get back on the floor. I had the taste of being on the floor as an assistant coach my last year at Northern and then going back to the ops, and I, I wanted to get back really to where a place where I thought basketball was really important and where you can compete at a, at a national level. And that's what's different than in our league in Division Three, where if you're one of the best teams in our league, you're going to be able to compete at a national level, where there's so many low major schools out there that can't say that. Right. They can't say that. And that and no offense to them. It's just not what I was looking for. I wanted to get back to a place where I could get on the court and I uh, were into a league that is the SEC of college football, where basketball is important. What's the adjustment like going from the Division One level to the Division Three level? And you can take that in whatever direction you want to go in terms of players on the floor in terms of the resources in terms of the size of the staff we know there's a lot of differences but just what were some of the things that you had to adjust to going from the division one back to the division three level it's it's um coach Semling, you know experienced division one and then i did and we wanted to run a division one program at a division three level but just doing it with two guys so you had to do everything right you just the what what division ones have two, three, four guys be able to do, you're going to do that with one person. But to give the, uh, the players that experience, right, that first-class experience of, of scouting reports and travel and meals and things like that. Now, the difference is rather than eating in a hotel and, and spending $38, you know, for, you know, for chicken and pasta, um, and, instead you're going to get Jersey Mike's and, and talk, you know, talk about how great that Chipotle cheesesteak is, you know, afterwards. <laughs> Right. But but it's that same thing. You're just doing it a little bit different way. But you can give, you know, rather than giving a Nike T-shirt, you give them a Gildan T-shirt. But that Gildan T-shirt, you know, uh, the look on somebody's face was exactly the same as 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 it was even better than at Division One because they're just they're just a little bit more thankful for it. Um, but I think but the love for the game, the, you know, the love for the game, the passion for the game, they're. There's, it's certainly not less. I can tell you that. It's certainly not less. You know, uh, um, Jack Bennett, Dick Bennett w would have the saying, good basketball knows no level, right? If And it's the same thing. Good players 
uh, the players at our, at our level love the game, right? They love the game. And, and I, I would argue sometimes they love the game even more because they're getting into the gym when a coach isn't allowed to get into the gym with them, right? Where we'll have guys, we have nine guys up here this summer and they're in the gym every single day. And it has, I can't be in the gym with them, right? I can't be in there with them, but that's how much they love the game. They want to be in there, right? They want to be in the, they, they want to get better and they want to push themselves to get better. Not everybody, right? Not everybody's like that. And so I don't want to like talk about how it's all perfect in this, you know, it's Pleasantville and we never miss a shot, but, but just overall, it's, it's just, it's pure and it's genuine and it's just good stuff, right? It's just really, really good stuff. So I kind of went two different directions there with it, but, but I think there's more similarities than there are differences, to be honest with you. Um, I, I, I really do. At the end of your tenure there, you got an opportunity to take over as the interim head coach. Yeah. yeah. Which that's always been a situation that I feel like could go very, very well, but it could also go south really fast if it's not handled correctly, both by the coach, the players, the administration that's putting that interim coach in place. So just describe a little bit about what your experience was like going from being an assistant, obviously you already have a relationship with the players, but now that relationship changes when you become the head coach. Tell us a little bit about that experience and just what you remember from those last 13 games that you coached as the interim. Yeah, well, it was, it was in, in, the, in the profession, it was the hardest time of my life. Um, we lost to Oshkosh on a Wednesday and then we got brought into the office on a Thursday and and, and, and Coach Semling was told that he was going to be suspended for the rest of the season and that I was going to be the interim coach and that we were going to be on a postseason ban um, for, for, for some NCAA violations that um, it, it, I could get into that. And it, it just wasn't right, right? It just wasn't right. And, and so to sit into that room and tell young men that they're not allowed to compete in the postseason – and that their head coach couldn't even say bye to them it was the most emotional. I mean, I get I get emotional talking about it because it just wasn't right um, how it was handled. And those young men had were, the postseason was stripped from them. Right? We just were zero and one in league play, and and I'm going to be elevated now to try to direct them into their senior year and juniors and things like that, and. And the character that they showed, the character that they showed and the belief that they had in, in that program and in our system. And then, you know, and I got the benefit from that because I don't want to say they believed in me. I was just the benefactor of them believing in the program and the system, you know, for us to, to finish um, eight and five and be the hottest team in the league, um, you know, down the stretch, winning five of our last six games. It just it, uh, it it's again the beauty of Division Three, where I remember we're playing Platteville in the last game of the year, and they can't. Platteville was out of the playoff hunt. I think they were one in thirteen that year, or something like that. It was like one of the last one of the one of the last years. Coach Guard hasn't been incredible, right? And he's been incredible. I'm just saying, like he just had a bad season at Platteville, and and then we weren't able to go. So this is like on a Saturday night. Two teams, their season is done. And it was the most competitive game that maybe I was one of the most competitive games that I've been a part of. And it and some people would be like, it was for nothing. It was for nothing, but it was for something. It was for pride and love of the game, right? Just love of the game. And that's when uh it was just during that time that I felt comfortable um in my own voice, right? In my own voice of directing. And it was a challenge. I mean Ironically, we were told that on a Thursday and on, on Saturday, we had to travel to lacrosse who was, you know, ranked 20th in the country. And we ended up beating them by 25 because it could have went either way, right? Either we were going to get, we were going to get pummeled or <laughs> our guys were going to rise up. We're going to rise up through those circumstances and play really well. And they played great, right? They played great. And, and then we were able to ride that the, the, the rest of the year. But I'll, I'm, I'm so thankful to those guys, those seniors, those juniors who just, um, just relied on their passion and their love for the game 
to give me a good experience. Because if we fell on our face, right? If we would have fell on our face, I don't know if I could have recovered from that, right? I'm not sure if I would have recovered from that um, and how 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 um, fragile coaching confidence is and coaching is. But because of they because of their foundation through their parents and the foundation that Coach Sem had, we were able to rise up and be the hottest team down the stretch. And that gave that gave me great confidence. I was able to be the, again the benefactor from from everything that was put into place um, prior to me taking over as the interim coach. What did you learn? If you could boil it down to one or two key lessons that you learned in that time that have carried over to your time as the head coach at lacrosse. Um, that if you get the right people, right, it's the, the saying, you don't know, you don't know who you can win with until you lose with them or something like that. I am so bad at sayings. But like, <laughs> we get, but, we get right, what you're saying. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like, it's just the character, like recruit character, right? Recruit character guys, recruit guys that are, that are about the right things because they can get through, get you through all those tough situations. I think that's a hundred percent right. And when you talk about college coaching in particular, the idea that a lot of what you do, a lot of your job entails, Hey, you got to get the right people in the door to begin with that have the right type of character and are the right type of players. And then once you have those kinds of guys on campus, then you can start to mold those guys into the type of team that you want. If you get, if you bring in guys who are bad apples or guys who don't have the kind of character that you want, it's really easy for things to go in a direction that you as the head coach don't want it to do. And so certainly building a quality program and building a winning team starts with the recruiting process and how you go about making sure that you get the right guys in the door. So let's, Let's go there right now and just talk a little bit about recruiting. When you're out there and you're on the recruiting trail, and we've talked to a lot of Division Three coaches about just the challenge that you face as a Division Three coach because clearly a lot of the guys that you're recruiting, if you're going to be successful and compete on the national level like you've talked about, then the type of players that you want to bring and that you need to bring in are probably guys that can play at a higher level and maybe even have offers to play at a higher level where guys might turn down a D2 scholarship to come and play for you at Wisconsin lacrosse to play division three basketball because of the type of program that you're building. So how do you go about, first of all, identifying the players that are on your initial list of guys you're going to consider. And then as you start to narrow that down and obviously guys have to show a mutual interest, but what do you, how do you go about narrowing down that initial list of whatever, 50, 75 guys or, or however many you have on that initial list that you get from high school contacts and AAU contacts and just putting together that that first group of however many you put together? How do you, how do you narrow that down? Well, it, it, it starts with um, you have to get an eye on everybody, right? And, and that's it, it sounds pretty basic, but at our level, you really do have to get an eye on, on every single player um, in Wisconsin, in in Minnesota, <clears throat> in you know Chicago or Northern Illinois, if we're going to recruit there, uh, to be able to evaluate them, it, it doesn't mean that you have to do like a great evaluation on them, but you have to have an, an idea um, um, of who they are and is it something that you want to con- continue to uh, somebody that you want to continue to pursue? Because at our it's it's you're you're feeling out are they. Are, can they help you win? Are they Division three player? Are they Division two player? Are they Division one? Are they Division one? But they have some parents that really love Division three. Are are they Division three? But their their parents and their AAU coach thinks they're Division two. So then they end up doing something else. Like there, those are like those are I think are some of the most important questions. Is trying to figure out of like who who's excited? Who can you get involved with? And who are you wasting time on? And who, who, where, where can you actually get some bang for your buck, you know, with it? Now, how do you get to that list of like the guys that you're really excited about? Well, you know, for us, um, it's guys that I believe that can guard, right? When I came to lacrosse, it's, it's, it's the success that we had at Stevens Point, winning a national title, um, um, bringing that to lacrosse where we are going to guard. We're, we're going to defend and 
is it guys that I feel have the potential to be able to do that? And then um, in addition to that, you know, can they make a shot and all that other good stuff? But rarely do we bring somebody in here that I that uh, that I'm really concerned. Like, will they ever be able to defend at a high level? Because we're going to pride ourselves on on that side of the basketball. We're motion offense and man to man defense. So, um, and and that's going to be the foundation to our program. And then from there, once you identify that list, a lot of times it's just having the dust settle a little bit, Mike, right? Where it gets into August and September. Okay, well, these guys haven't been um, offered yet from a Division II, so now let's get them on campus. We don't get a whole lot of kids on campus during the summer unless they're like traveling up to the cities or something like that. Maybe they want to swing through, but I just don't like getting guys on campus during the during the summer. I'd rather have the dust settle a little bit, and then we just kind of go after them. And, and what we try to do here um, at Lacrosse is specifically target guys. Like, hey, we can't offer a Ross, we can't offer a scholarship, but we can offer a roster spot and and go at it that way. Where where you know we're not going to have a huge roster size. Now, with that being said, COVID has has increased our roster size because no, because we've had guys that uh, that want to stay and use their their COVID year. But but we went from like having 40, 45 kids, you know, trying out each year. Um, you know, that's what I walked into my first day of practice to by year three, we had 15 on our roster. So just being really selective with them and 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 going after that player. And, you know, that means you're it, it gets a little um, a little scary down the stretch into March and April, um, <laughs> especially later in April, because those kids haven't committed yet those kids are always going to take longer right but thankfully thankfully because of our university and our academic standard and hopefully our program a little bit we've been able to get right around 40 to 45 percent of our top recruits and if you're able to do that then you know i think you if you're recruiting the right kids you probably got a chance to be all right when you're doing your evaluation how do you weigh their performance with their high school team versus what you see when you watch them play aau basketball yeah it's a great question. It's a really, really. I I think you you have to watch both. You have to watch both. Uh, Ethan Anderson for us is is going to be an All American this next year. He was a third team All American this past year, and you know he's he's coming back. And um, he was terrible with his high school team. Couldn't get anything done. In fact, down the stretch, his high school. I mean, excuse me, his AAU team. They they want to play him right. They they just want to play him. And his high school team, you know, is averaging twenty seven a game. And just could get a lot of things done out there. You have to watch both. So, um, if if there's things that are concerning you um, on the AAU side, and then you see it on the high school side, then it's like, uh, uh, then that's probably not your guy. But if it's something that's um, outside of you know, bad attitude and you know, are they a pig on offense and things like that? But if it's just some things like, oh, he just doesn't attack here, but then he comes in with his high school team and he attacks, well, that's probably what you can get him to do, right? So I really do kind of evaluate each each thing um, um, equally, right? I mean, I I love watching kids with their high school team and and the the structure that comes with it, but I also think you have to evaluate evaluate them in AAU because maybe. You know, their high school team scores 40 or 45 a game and they sit in a 2-3 zone or a 1-3-1 one, one, and, and we have the sh- we don't have a shot clock in Wisconsin. So that's a little bit harder to evaluate. That makes a lot of sense. I think both environments clearly have advantages and disadvantages when you think about how does that translate to your level. Because ultimately that's what you're trying to figure out is which kids yeah. do you think can come in and play at your level. And then when you talk about, again, at the Division three. At the Division three level, you just have that that constant battle when you're recruiting of kids who probably think, "Hey, I can play at that at that next level above," and and you're trying to convince them that it's about the fit and it's about being in the right program. And it's you know it's it's constantly I think it's constantly a challenge. And one of the things that's also interesting, and I'm sure this is probably your experience as well, that we've talked to a lot of Division three coaches that you know tell us that when they're sitting now with the recruit that a lot of times and Wisconsin may be a little bit of a different situation because of just again how good the the WEAC is, just the familiarity that players probably have with the league. But in a lot of places you have 
players being recruited by Division three schools and they've never even sat in a gym and watched a Division three game. So they really yeah. have no idea how good the level of play is. I think the average high school player, if you were to go to an AAU tournament, you walk up to high school players and parents and how many of them have familiarity with really how good the Division three game is. I think a lot of them are completely clueless, clueless as to how good the players really are. Yeah, it's, it's a great point. I mean, and you, uh, it's like coaching. Coaching, you need to, I believe, uh, you should tr- try to get to the level that you want to be at. If you want to be a Division three coach, then, then coach in Division three. I, I, I think if you want to be high school, then you got to coach in high school. I think things have tightened up more within divisions where you want to be. And I'm making the comparison then if if you want to coach or play at Division two, then you have to watch a Division two game. You have to watch a Division three game uh, to, to see the level of competition because it, it and because there really is no convincing. If somebody if somebody thinks they're a higher level, you might end up getting them. You might end up getting them, but rarely do they actually work out because because they're going to fail. They're going to come in. They're going to come in and they're 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 not going to be one of your the best players out there. And then it's like, oh, I thought I was division two or division one or something and I can't even play here. And it's usually such a shot to their ego that they end up not working out. And a lot of times, <laughs> you know what I mean? Does that make yeah. sense? No, it makes where, like, sense. They just, and, and, and I, that's where I, I, I that's, if you're just going off like rankings, like like rankings for I the disservice that I think I know rankings have to be out there, but the disservice that they do to so many kids where there there are so many kids like where hey this year in the state of Wisconsin, um, the 15th best player was a clearly a Division One player, but then two years after that the 15th best player was was at best a Division Three player, and and then. But they don't. They might not understand it. And then the parents always want, might want something more. And then it's like, well, if their son comes here, then he's a failure, right? He's a failure. And they don't say that, but their actions say that. And and so then, rather than doing that, let's just quit. Don't play. And the amount of times that that we've just come across really really good players that end up not playing anywhere. Or having memorable careers, which you think they should have, you know, it just it just happens. It just happens, and and some of that I believe is is the is is they didn't live up to expectation with with Division three, and and it's put on them by not themselves. It's put on them by those around them. Having the right expectations is so critical when you think about. The recruiting process, but even when you think about, hey, what kind of career are you going to have, or what kind of season are you going to have, and if if you've got a player who, let's say he's already in your program and he didn't play very much as a freshman, and he comes in as a sophomore and he's behind a guy at his position who's a senior that's played for four years, if that kid comes in with the expectation that, hey, this is my year, I'm gonna I'm gonna get 32 minutes a game, well. They're probably going to be disappointed because their expectations just aren't calibrated correctly. Whereas that kid comes in and says, "Hey, maybe I can get four minutes a game as player X's backup, and next year is going to be my year." And I work at it and I do those things by setting the correct expectations. You can have the exact same experience, but it can go completely differently just because of how you frame going into what that's going to look like. And I think so much of that we talked about earlier, I think so much of that comes from the people around the player as opposed to the player themselves. Yeah. And it's, you, you, we talked about this earlier is the trust, right? And the recruiting process, the trust for sure. And being honest, being honest with them where, you know, what our first recruiting class here at, at UW lacrosse, um, uh, we were, we were, it was an interim coach. I was an interim coach the first year, right? It, uh, the job got posted, the previous head coach, Ken Cable, left be- right before the season started. So, so we're recruiting and we're like, hey, you just got to wait. You got to wait till the end. You got to wait till the end to see if I can get the job, um, what it is. And I remember this kid named uh, Seth Anderson from us where he's like, well, coach, these two other schools are telling me that they can go there and I can probably start and play. And I said, well, Seth, 
you're not going to do that here. We have Brendan Manning. And it was the year that we made the NCAA tournament the, the next year, his freshman year. And you're, you're probably not going to play. And, and if we didn't have that conversation, Seth would have transferred after his freshman year. There's no doubt about it. We, I mean, and the list goes on and on like that, where if, if, you, if you let them know early on, then they realize it and mom and dad realize it. And, and that's why they have to be on there on the recruiting visit. And we sit on the couch and I talk to the parents about this. Austin Wester for us, who's going to be a really, really good player next year. And if we're, and if we're good, it's, he's going to have a huge part in that. I remember his freshman year, we won um, at, at a tournament at Loris. We beat Concordia out of Wisconsin. And he's crying after the game. And he doesn't know why he's crying. He doesn't, he's like, Coach, I don't know why I'm crying. Well, it was for the first time in his career, mom and dad were there. Grandma and grandpa were there. His girlfriend was there and he never played a minute, right? He never played a minute and he didn't know how to handle that. The emotion that he had, he's six foot six, beautiful, I mean, just a specimen, right? You look at him, you're like, that guy, that guy, he's going to, he's somebody, you know, he, he's emotional afterwards and he wasn't being selfish about it, Mike. He just didn't know how to, that was, he just didn't ever feel that before. And thankfully, we had those conversations and his parents were knew what was going to happen and were there for him and got him through it. And, you know, he, he led us in plus minus last year, you know, as a junior and uh, is the reason why one of the reasons why we won our, our an NCAA tournament game for the first time in program history is is because he was able to get through those tough moments. Being able to do that and have that perseverance when you look at where we are with the transfer portal at the college level, and then you think about just how the trickle down of players transferring in high school. And then clearly when you think about players jumping programs in AAU and it's, it seems like there's this trend of if things get tough or things don't go the way that you want them to go, the way your family wants them to go, that you're just going to pack your bags and go on to the next opportunity. And I think people so often forget that, no matter what situation you're in, it's rarely perfect. And there's always going to be things that you have to fight through and there's always going to be adversity. And to me, when I walk, look at the college landscape, especially at the division one level, and you see so many kids that, man, if they could just be a little bit patient and understand that their opportunity, yeah, maybe you're not going to be a starter as a freshman, but guess what? Put in a year, put in two years, and maybe you're going to get an opportunity. But I think so many people, and this goes back to, the very beginning of our conversation, when you think about being a parent and about why your kid plays sports and what you want from that experience for them, I feel like so many people are chasing the next thing that too often they forget to focus on where they are now. You talked about it in your coaching career, like be good at the job that you're doing right now. And I feel like so many High school players are just worried about well, where am I going to go to college instead about instead of worrying about hey let me have a great high school career or I'm playing AAU basketball and I want to utilize that to be able to secure my position as a high school starter I'm in college and hey I got to be able to put up these stats because maybe I can transfer and go to a higher level or I need to be able to have a pro career when I'm done instead of just trying to maximize the experience that you have in the moment I think that. The story you just told is a great example of sometimes you just got to stick with it and keep working and keep working. And then you're going to have that moment that you're looking for, but you have to be able to focus on the here and now and not always worry about that pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Yeah. And, and, and I think it's not like I'm insulting, you know, kids that transfer or the portal or anything, anything like that. What I can just speak to is, is the division three level and because kids, we're not giving them anything, right? We're not giving them a scholarship. We're telling them on the way in, this is going to be the hardest thing you ever do in your life. And you're going to fail before you succeed. Be, there, we're like on this common ground to fight through adversity compared to offering a scholarship, convincing them how great it's going to be. You're, you're, you're not 
in an environment that allows you to fight through a tough moment. And I, I don't know how to fix that at Division One or Division Two or whatever it is. And and again, I could have egg in my face next year because three guys could leave our program or something like that. <laughs> but I'm just saying, like, like right now, you know what I mean? Like we're just on the same – there's a balance and there's this harmony, you know, within Division Three, where I make $70,000 a year. Yeah, that's probably about right, you know, for coaching basketball, in my opinion. You know, like, I, you know, there's a lot of other things that might pay a little bit more, but I make it more than some people, you know, out there. I mean, that's, 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 you know, anybody can look up the Wisconsin state salary. So it's not like it's any secret out there. That's what I make a year, $70,000. And that's kind of about right, you know, because I'm into it for the, for the right thing. We don't, we don't go to a hotel and, and have, ice cream socials afterwards for $18 a head because that's what we have to do. You know, I mean, if we would give them, if we would give them, uh, um, uh, go out for ice cream it, when at, during the NCAA tournament, our AD Kim Bloom brought in Krispy Kreme donuts and it was, <laughs> it was the best thing in the world, man. That's awesome. It was, that's awesome. It was amazing because it's genuine. It's pure. I just feel like there's this harmony and there's this balance within division three and i'm not insulting any other level out there the best coaches are in high school everybody knows that right i mean anybody that doesn't think that's an idiot that's where the best coaches are but there's just this balance between player and coach i believe between player and program at the division three level and it's because of the makeup um, um uh, that that they come into it's so interesting when you talk about just what it's like from a lifestyle standpoint as Division Three head coach versus what it's like to be at the Division One level. And I've had this conversation now with a couple of different coaches at both levels, thinking about the way that Division One runs their off season and just how much access coaching staffs now have to players. And I equate it back to my situation as a player. And I was so – when our season would end – I just wanted to go play pickup and work on my yeah. game and just get back and, and not have the coaches chirping in my ear every single second. And if I would have had to turn around and a week after the season, go back and do individual workouts with the same coaching staff that had been on me all season, I don't know that I don't know that I would have I don't know that I would have survived yeah. four years. I mean I needed that time away. And obviously at the division three level, that's what's in place. You can't have that contact on the floor with your players in the off season. So I think there's probably somewhere in between the two where I'm sure you'd like to have a little bit of access to your players in the off season. But yet I feel like the amount of access that they have at the division one level, to me, that's not good for players or coaches. Cause I just think you need to be able to get away from the scenario because it just seems like it would get stale over and over again the same thing so if you could wave a magic wand and just sort of design what a what an off season what would an ideal off season look like for you if if you could design it and have it be ncaa violation free <laughs> yeah uh, i i just i wish we would go to days rather than weeks in division three in division three we do weeks so i don't know how familiar you are with that or but we we get 19 weeks from October, whatever you start in October, you can start as early as October 15th and you have to declare your week until the uh, until your conference championship game. You yep. get 19 weeks to do that. I wish that they would go to days. That's what we did during COVID. And then you can break up. So if you wanted to start, if you would like to have like a random practice in September or October, then you can do that. If you wanted to save a couple days into April or the first week in May right before finals, you can do that. And you could get onto the court you know, with, um, you know, with your guys, I wish they wouldn't, you know, treat, uh, treat players, um, so fragile. They can handle that. They want that actually, right. They want that. They're frustrated that they can't get it, but to protect it, you know, give, they give us 114 days during COVID. You know, I wish they would give like right around 125 days that you can use throughout it because then I, I also think it's a better experience because, you know, on October 15th or the 16th that we'll start this year, um, we're going to go twice. And then we're going to go twice the next day. And then we're going to go twice the next day. Because a week and a half later, we're scrimmaging a Division Two, And then we're going to scrimmage another Division Two, And then we play five straight NCAA tournament teams. So that's what you do, right? 
And how is that a really a good experience for the student athletes when you when you got to make up and you got to go twice? You know, why not break it up a little bit more? And then I would say, you know, during the summer, um, if they're up there, you know, to work camp, then they could be around and you can work them out during camp, you know, if they're up there. I, I, I am fine with guys getting away. I think they need that time, Mike, um, to, to do that. In, in fact, I think our guys get better. I think they get there's so much growth into April and May and June and July when they're in the gym with one another getting getting each other better. Like I wouldn't want to be able to be with them all the time in September and October because that's our time for our seniors to get guys together to organize it and and work with them, right? And work with them and and try to teach a little bit and hear their voice and grow. You know, all the time in the recruiting process, you know, we'll always hear like Oh, I got, I, you know, Jimmy, Jimmy's got, he's got a trainer. He loves the game, works out with his trainer three times a week, four times a week. Well, that's great. That's great. But does Jimmy get into the gym without his trainer? Because that's what division three is. And does Jimmy get into his, into the gym without his trainer? Because that's what it takes to be a good player. Or is Jimmy only getting into the gym with his trainer? And that's what I think you end up seeing so much. And that's a little bit more comparable compare, uh, comparison to the scholarship level where they're getting into the gym always with a coach rather than on their own. And the game is, I mean, it's meant to be played. And it's meant to be fun. And, and you can you can just get better that way. Like, I, I just think we recruit you know, Ethan Anderson, that the, the good player I was telling you about. And his dad questioned me on that. I remember him, well, how, how can that be? And I, I said, there's just something about the system, putting having having a gym available to them, having teammates around them that love the game, and having a culture where guys want to get into the gym, I believe you can get better. That doesn't mean that trainers, and I wouldn't want to be in there with them, or they, they couldn't get a, a little more direction in there, but they can get better on their own with a teammate. It's like why it's like another, it's like I love the gun, but I hate the gun. I hate the gun because I'd rather get have them get in the gym with a teammate to rebound, to go two on oh. Let's go some. Let's go circle behind. I'm going to rip it. I'm going to drive it at you. You're going to circle behind. And can we go two in a row? That's where you get better, right? Oh, Mike, I sorry. I just go <laughs> off on this on this. No, stuff, you're, but... you're 100% right. I think what's interesting when you think about getting out and getting shots up and being able to do that on your own or with a teammate. So as a player, when I was playing, I had two workouts. I had a workout that I did by myself and – I had a workout that I did if I had somebody to partner up with me. And that wasn't a very creative guy. So you're talking about like probably seven years of doing the, the same two uh, the same two workouts. But uh, to your point about about the gun, like I would have loved having the gun and been able to shoot and be able to, uh, to, to use a machine to be able to get up reps. And that would have been something I would have loved to do. And at the same time, I think about how much I learned being in the gym by myself and shooting and being able to sense, okay, where's my shot going to go and looking at it off the rim and knowing where it's going to go and then just working on moving without the ball, which is way easier to do when you're with yourself than you are when you're doing that with a machine where it's much easier to just kind of stand still. And then when you're rebounding for somebody, I think about the amount of times from the, again, back when I was in elementary school, how many times I'm rebounding for somebody and the number of shots that I watch fly towards the rim and being able to read in the air where that ball is going to go. And kids today, they don't really rebound for anybody. So I think like that knack of knowing, hey, where the ball is going to come off the rim, those are things that are just kind of missing. And it's interesting. We can circle all the way back to the beginning of our conversation about being a sports parent. And this conversation is almost identical to that one where it's like if you want to get better, the only way you're going to get better is if you want to be in the gym and – you want to work hard and you're the one that's investing in it versus look, I, as you said, trainers can certainly help and being with coaches for a workout can certainly help. But man, you can't tell me that you can't achieve 99% of the efficiency that you can with a coach or a trainer just because you love it and you have things that you want to get better on and, and work at. And so it's just, uh, there's more than one way to skin a cat, but I, I just think that if you can get in the gym and you can get kids in your program that want to get in the gym by themselves and work at it, you're, I mean, you're, you're almost there in terms of what you want to do and what the kind of program you want to build. Yeah. They're just more skin in the game, right? There's more yep. skin in the game. Like 
hey, they had to go online and look up a program. They right. had to go online and they and they you know they watched Steph shirt uh, Steph Curry shooting it or they, they you know they they got Tim Duncan's video and and worked on his twenty minute thing or Steve Nash's you know uh, you know uh, workout or something like that right that they they just have more skin in the game where they're taking the time to do it because because the the guys that and the people that end up being good players they'll do that anyways even without a trainer right. If I, I, if you have that personality and you're willing to look something up and go be a little bit more to get a workout in and be efficient, well, you're going to get that done. Or you could have been with a trainer and have been the same thing, right? It'd have been the same thing. Or you're somebody that has no interest in doing that, never wants right. to do that. And you could get with a trainer, but you're going to end up being the same damn player. You're going to end up being the same player. It just, it has nothing to do. Uh, I shouldn't say that because there's great trainers out there. God, I don't want to like piss in. It depends on what the, like pl- the player has to bring enthusiasm to it, right? Yes, That's ultimately exactly. what it comes yeah. down to. If the player, yeah, yeah. if you're working with a trainer and the player brings enthusiasm to it and they're putting their best into it, yep. then hey, you can get a ton out of it. Same way yeah, if you're then, there by yourself. Because then they don't have to like, yeah, yep. Yep, because then they don't have to go to YouTube. They have an expert telling them what to do, right? And right. then so they they can break through this this glass ceiling that they maybe they never could if they had a trainer. But I think we're both on the same page. Yeah, I think it's just it's what you it's what you as the player bring to the table. And then when you think about yourself and your role as a coach, hopefully what you've done is you've developed a program that inspires kids to want to work hard. So you bring in guys who already have that proclivity to be a hard worker and somebody that you want to have in your program. But then in the course of you having influence of, on them over their four years, those are kids that hopefully want to get in the gym, want to get better, want to continue to improve because they want to have an opportunity to get out on the floor, which is why oh, anybody yeah. plays, right? When you when you think about what do basketball players want, they want to be in the game. And then once they're in the game, they want to be able to do something with the ball occasionally. And so the only way you can do that is by working on your game and getting better and improving. And if you develop the kind of culture that you want in your program, I don't care if it's high school, I don't care if it's AAU, I don't care if it's college basketball, whatever, then you're developing those kinds of kids that want to get better and improve because they want to be out on the floor. They want to be a part of it. Yeah. The game is meant to be played. Exactly. There's no question about it. There's no question about that. All right. I have... I have two final questions for you. So yeah. first one is, as a head coach, where are you in your own development in terms of feeling confident in your philosophy and just where you are in terms of believing in yourself as a head coach? Because obviously, as a rookie head coach, you come in and you're trying to figure it out. You've watched a bunch of other guys coach as you've been part of staffs and you've taken bits and pieces from them, and you're still trying to figure it out. Where are you in terms of figuring yourself out as a head coach? Um, I'm 100% confident in that I believe in man-to-man defense and motion offense. What I struggle with on the motion side is um, when do you sprinkle in set plays, and should you sprinkle in set plays? I probably battle with that nearly every day or every other day um just in my mind of like because uh, uh, there'll be times where you just want to get your best player maybe a shot so then you want to do a little something for him but then i know i know as soon as you do that you take away from being a true motion offense team and and i i saw that for five years six years at uw stevens point we never had a set play in our system and you know Went to four NCAA tournaments, won a national title, and another couple Sweet Sixteens. Never running, never, never having a set play, having one, um, one or two baseline out of bounds plays. And I took that to lacrosse, where we are going to be a man-to-man defense, motion offense team. And it was really to the extreme my first two years, where I refused to do anything else on the on the <laughs> offensive end. Refused, like, and 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 it might have been our downfall, right? It's I I don't know. I know our players were actually frustrated with it. Um, at times because we are going to be a motion offense team and man-to-man defense. and um, But I also know I think we rose to a really good level there and we, we, we created a foundation in our program. 
But now since that point, you know, I've, I've tinkered with things where I've thrown in, I've thrown in one or two high ball screen, you know, uh, in a game. And, and then I look back and I'm like, well, maybe, maybe it got us a look for that possession, but did it cost us getting three looks later on in the game or the next game? Because I just didn't get our guys to feel comfortable moving when they were tired, you know, reading it, trusting it, going next pass, you know, all of that stuff in a tough moment, right? You don't know if you really can be a good motion offense team until when tough moments happened. And usually early on in the season, there's a whole lot of tough moments when you're just a strict motion offense team. But like, you know, like all that stuff, like that's where I struggle, you know, um, uh, quite often is can, can you do both things? Um, can you do both things? And, and I don't know the answer to that, right? I, I, I really don't uh, think sometimes somebody could tell me, oh, yeah, you could, you could sprinkle in this. Yeah, and then I, I can come right back and I can give you a bunch of examples of telling you why you're an idiot. And you're like, yeah, you can say that you're a motion offense team, but you're not. But you're not. You know, this is what you go to in crunch time because it's just like anything. What are you when things are when the what, what are you when things are bad? What kind of character do you have when things aren't going your way? Well, what are you when the game is on the line? When the game is on the line, are you trusting your guys to make a play? Have you done a good enough job in practice that you got them comfortable that where they can read and react off one another, that they can run five-man motion, or do you need control, right? You need control to draw something up on that damn whiteboard to, to get somebody a shot, you know? And I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I, I would like to think that I'm somebody that would trust our players out there. We've done that more often than not. But I also know we played an NCAA tournament and – and and I drew something up. So who am I, right? Who am I? And <laughs> it's, am always I in pro- it's always a work in progress. It's always a work in progress, right? Yeah. It's a work in progress. Yeah. And I think there's never, yeah. there's not an end point, right? There's not. I don't think there's a hard and fast rule. It's just a matter of you. You keep growing. You keep learning. You keep trying yeah. to figure it out. And we all do that. And whether it's basketball coaches or in life, there's just different things that you try to work on and continue to figure out and wrestle with your in your own mind and obviously when you watch something happen and then you take that and you process it and you come back and you try to do it better the next time whatever it is and whichever whichever decision you end up making all right last two-part question part one when you look ahead what's the biggest challenge that you see ahead of you in the next year or two and then part two when you think about what you get to do every day what brings you the most joy about being the head men's basketball coach at UW lacrosse? So your biggest challenge and then your biggest joy. Um, the challenge is, is right now where we're at with, a, with our program is, can we, can we take a step forward? Um, where, where we've had some really, really nice success over the last five years. We've made two NCAA tournaments. We, we won a, a Wyack West crown. We've, we've, We've given our program, our guys have given, given this program this first NCAA tournament um, win in, in program history. There's back-to-back 21-win seasons, you know, tying the school record for that. There's really, really good things with that, but we haven't won anything. We haven't, we haven't, we haven't won a, a conference tournament title. We haven't won a conference championship outright. We haven't advanced to a Sweet 16. And it's that it's that next step that I know is the most challenging, right? Where I didn't take over a bad program. Ken Cable before me won 200 games. He's a great coach and a really really good man. And so we certainly, but but we have the program wasn't making NCAA tournaments and wasn't consistently finishing in the top two or three in the conference. You know, every single year. So, um. We've gotten to that point, but then it's that next step to there, Mike. Like, and 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 back to your previous question. This is this is where you start to question yourself. Am I the guy that can get us there? Can, am I tough enough to get us there? Does our system good enough to get us there? Right? Can I get? Can I push the right buttons? You know, down the stretch to be able to to win us one more game to bring home a conference tournament type, uh, conference champion, regular season championship to to win. 
not just advance to the conference championship game, to, but to actually win the damn thing, to win something, right? I think that's where our, our program needs to go. And, um, but, I, but I know it's not easy. I'm so humble to understand the thin line between winning and losing in basketball, specifically in men's basketball, because every team, every program, every high school, Every NEIA, every 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 pro, every university, I think thinks they they can be good at men's basketball because it takes five guys and it really just takes you know can you get a couple good players and you could beat anybody right? That's what's just so unique the the parity and and it's why the NCAA tournament makes billions of dollars because of the parity that's out there. Anybody can actually win, and am I the guy that can actually do that? Right? Can I push the right buttons? and find the, the right matchups and all that stuff that comes with it. Um, so I think that's maybe like the biggest challenge. That next step is, I know is the toughest step to take. And you know, I, some days I think we're making steps forward, but, but then I, every time I think we're taking a step forward, we take two steps back you know, from that. <laughs> right. Yep. You know, type of thing. And, you know, and I think the, the, the joy is I get to do what I love. I just get to do what I love. And um, I, um, the Jerry Sloan, I heard him say this one time, you know, like he thought he was the one of the luckiest men because he, he had the answer to the, to the two most important questions that he thinks are in life. And it's who, who do you love? Who are you going to spend the rest of your time with in, in, uh, you know, on this earth? Like, is there somebody out there? And then what do you love to do? And fortunately for me, like uh, I married my high school sweetheart where like I had that question answered and I'm fortunate enough to have the question answered of like, what do I want to do? And I get to do it, you know, every single day, Um, you know, to go out to see a team develop, be around young men that are passionate about it, to be a part of something that's bigger than yourself, where alumni and fans and supporters are interested in what you do again that's like selfish you know that's like self-fulfilling like why did i get into it i love the look that steve durakovich gave to me coaching him well here it's like you know you know people are interested in my job and that's fun right that's that's interesting and or that uh, that's enjoyable but uh, you know i i i've had the ant i've been able to, and i'm fortunate enough to to have the answer to those two questions and then in addition to that is kind of a it goes back to, you know, my parents and my dad is like, my dad stuttered and he still stutters to this day. And he always wanted to coach Mike, right? He just always wanted to coach. And I get to do uh, uh, something that he was passionate about. Like I would hope for, for Memorial Day weekend. And I walk into the shed, I walk into the shop where it just, it, it's so, it's dirty, it's old, oil, you know, it's just a farm. It's a farm office. And on the whiteboard, it has move without the ball, move without <laughs> the ball. And then there's a big line. And then it said game speed. And then there's another line where it says help move the ball. I mean, this guy's 84 years old. I haven't been home and he hasn't coached forever. He was never, he never had the official title of coach. And that's, I, I keep that on my Twitter account because the best coaches out there often don't have the official title of head coach ever in their career, right? And, and, and I get to do what something that he uh, was so passionate about. Uh, but anyways, Mike, you know, you start, you start talking about things that you love and you start, and that's just my personality. So you get emotional about it because it means something to you. And, and I just had really good people around my life with my family and now my wife um, and kids really don't got a choice in it. You know, they don't, they, they just tell me what to do when I get home, but they don't got a choice in it, but they get, they, they allow me to do what I love. Right. And this is what I love doing. And to be able to do it every day is it, it's just really, it's just really, really special stuff. That's a great answer. And what I love about it is that it incorporates, you get to do something that you love with the people that you love. And that's your family, 
with your players and you get to use the game of basketball to be able to have an impact and to be able to have all those pieces of it come together. I don't think there's anything better than that when you think about how good the game has been to you. And we think about that when it comes to the podcast and all the things that the game of basketball has done for me. And in some small way, just this podcast represents to me a way to be able to give back to the game and to allow guys like yourself to be able to share their story. And then hopefully there's some people out there in the audience that get to listen and find some value in what it is that we're trying to do. And that's, that's really when, when your passion meets with something that you get to do every day, there's, there's really nothing, there's nothing better. There's nothing that can top that. No, no, it's, you know, I, I, I look back and my dad's, uh, you know, I, I remember, I remember my mom, you know, when you, you put in a crop, right. You put in a crop, you're a farmer, you put in a crop and then you work like hell, right. To, to work the fields, to pick rock, to make, to make a really good yield, right. To make a really, really good yield. But at any point, hail can come and wipe away your crop. It can wipe it away. There can be a drought. There can be anything. There can be a storm or tornado that comes and it, it wipes it away with it. I remember my mom one time, there's like a, 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 a bad storm coming and she goes out and she's praying, right? She, she's out in the field praying like before a tornado is about ready to come. And and I just, and basketball isn't 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 like life and death like that. And not that that's life and death, but, but it is your your well-being and what you make money doing, right? And I just think, I, I think so many times that's the same thing in this sport, coaching, is like you have to put all that time and effort and work in, right? Just like you have to do in farming, all that time and effort and work to have the chance, to have the chance to have a really good yield. And that's what sports is. Like there is no guarantee you go out and win, but did you earn the right to play well? Did you earn the right to play well in practice? You know, did you have the did you earn the right to have a really good season? Did you put the work in as a coach and as a player to have a really good season? Did you earn that right? It's not guaranteed that you're going to get it, but you've given yourself the opportunity to maybe have that. And and you know, there is years like that we didn't know how to make ends meet or anything like that on the farm, but all you know how to do is you go out and you work again. You just jump in the tractor, you just go out and you take a chance that it's going to work for you. And you do it again and you do it again and you do it again. And I think I think sports and coaching is so much like that. It just it's it's it just builds so much resiliency and toughness that the only chance you have to earn the right to get the reward at the end is that you put the work in. And I guess that's probably maybe the 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 foundation to sport. And um and again, it's just something that I that I learned through my, I was fortunate enough to learn through 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 my parents. Well said. Put the work in, and not that you're guaranteed success, but certainly yeah. you have a much greater opportunity for success to find you if you're willing to put in the work. Before we get done, I want to give you a chance to share how people can reach out to you, how they can find out more about your program, share social media, email, website, whatever you feel comfortable how people can get in touch with you. And then after you do that, I'll jump back in and wrap things up. Yeah. So um, my email is uh, kdernbach at uwlax.edu. It's on the, it's on the website. Um, you know, like anybody else that just goes to my phone now, right? You can, uh, you Twitter. I don't even know what I am like Dernbach for we'll, or something like that. We'll, we'll, we'll figure know. it out and put it in the show notes for you. Yeah. Like, you know, anybody can reach out at, at any point. Cause uh, and none of it's like anybody else that you've had. None of my ideas are original, right? None of this stuff is is original to me. It's all stuff that I just hear and you regurgitate out. And then hopefully, hopefully though, that there's some substance to it. These are the things that I believe in, right? And hopefully people can tell that this is the stuff that I believe in, you know, when we do it. But I, if anybody thinks I can be any kind of benefit, which I don't know. <laughs> just, I don't know what I'm talking about, but I, 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 I love talking the game. Obviously, I love talking the game. You love talking the game, and it's love. It's so awesome to talk with somebody like you that just, that just gets it right. That just gets it. That understands how awesome this sport is. Well, thank you for your kind words. Love talking hoops, and that's why 
way back when we started this thing and why we've continued to stick with it and the opportunity to talk with coaches at all levels of the game and be able to pick the brains of people who do this day in and day out and hopefully share with our audience is really what it's all about. So, Kent, again, cannot thank you enough for taking the time out of your schedule to join us tonight. Really appreciate it. And to everyone out there, thanks for listening, and we will catch you on our next episode. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the Hoop Heads Podcast, presented by Head Start Basketball.